Bo Sears, welcome to Arlington's offices on Piccadilly in London. Um, so my name is Simon Catt. I'm a partner here at Arlington, um, working with Mining Network, uh, our partners here producing this. Um, we want to welcome you to London. You're a Texas oil man, live in Dallas. You've got a helium exploration asset in Montana. Um, why are you here in London today? Tell us. Exciting times. Thank you for having me, by the way. And, and uh, exciting times, IPO this morning uh, with great, you know, great fanfare. It was a, a, a wonderful event, well attended. You rang the bell at the London Stock Exchange? We did, yeah. this morning. Mm -hmm. Good. And the, I mean, it's been a pretty tough market here in London. I speak as a, as a banker, as an advisor, as a shareholder of a bunch of small companies listed in London. And like most parts of the world, they've been going down for the last two or three years. What I was interested about with the Helix Exploration IPO is it suddenly went from lukewarm to hot. And you went out looking for three or four million pounds and you came back with up to 20 demand. Is that right? It was amazing. The, the amount of excitement that we generated over here for helium exploration was, was uh, unseen anywhere else. I think that that's probably the hottest helium transaction that I know of anywhere in the world in recent years. Yeah. And, and North America, my understanding, Bo, um, let me also just let our viewers know that there's not much that you don't know about helium. And I've actually got a book here which is called The Future of Helium as a Natural Resource with a guy called Bill Nuttall and Richard Clark. And when I was opening this on the plane yesterday, reading it for a second time to get topped up on helium knowledge, I saw that you'd written the introduction all about the history of helium. Uh, and I think you've written another book yourself called Helium, The Disappearing Element. So is this an obsession? <laughs> it, it really is. It's, uh, it, it is a fascinating uh, value proposition. Helium is, is one of those commodities that is completely opaque. Uh, pricing is completely opaque. It was a commodity that was completely controlled by the United States government. They had a virtual monopoly on the on the commodity. And when Clinton came into office, he eliminated the, the uh, or mandated the closure of the federal helium system. The, why, why would he have done that? Well, it was a money losing venture at the time because private industry was able to produce helium at a far lower cost than the U.S. was selling their helium. So what was intended to be a good idea, uh, quickly became a bad idea. We were giving away helium for a song. Right. Because right at about the year 2000, uh, demand, especially in Asia, exploded. Okay. And why was that? What was the Asian source of demand? Was that semiconductors? Semiconductors, MRIs. Those are the two biggest users of helium. And those uses are, are continuing to grow today. Uh, and is, that, is there a linkage there in terms of those MRIs, semiconductors, the two largest uses of helium and future potential sources of helium demand. Most people know that helium is used in party balloons and maybe in the Hindenburg blimp for military uses back in World War I. But is it some unique characteristics or properties of helium which is what makes it useful in semiconductors and other futuristic applications? That's exactly right. So for most of helium's applications, it is the, there is no substitute by virtue of its atomic properties. So take MRIs, for instance, in the medical uh, field. They use liquid helium to, ha to uh, house those magnets. And by doing so, it creates a, 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 a thing called superconductivity that only happens at liquid helium temperatures. There is no other substance that is able to do that. So without helium, there are no MRIs. Uh, and I, I think I understand from going to a helium conference, bizarrely, last year, Bo, that um, the, the, new, the new largest use of helium today, and only taken the number one spot in the last year is semiconductor manufacturer. What do they use helium for as semiconductor manufacturer? It's used as a controlled environment. Okay. So when they manufacture these chips, they are grown and uh, they, they can't be contaminated by atmospheric air. Right. So air can be, you know, although it's mostly nitrogen and oxygen, those can contaminate uh, the, the fabrication of those crystals. And so they are grown in a helium only environment, a very, very far controlled because uh, helium is a, I happen to have read up on this, is a noble inert gas. Completely inert. Therefore, it's a completely sterilized manufacturing solution for semiconductors. That's exactly right. And it's used for leak detection. For instance, in airplanes, every single fuel system and fuel tank is, is, uh, is uh, tested for leaks, the tiniest of little leaks, and only helium can, uh, can detect those. And is it useful or relevant that one of the newest and fastest growing sources of helium demand is rockets? 
and seeing as you're sitting there in Elon Musk's backyard, I think he's got his rocket launch facility in Texas, does he not? He does. Um, he does. And I understand you use helium to cool the rockets uh, off gases. Use the the uh, helium to pressurize and purge the rocket engine. So as the as the uh, you know liquid hydrogen or oxygen is going down into the fuel systems, uh, they need a propellant to push it down into the rocket engines. And so the helium will fill the void so as not to become a crumpled can. And so if we think about the fact that semiconductors is growing at sort of double digit rates a year, <clears throat> rockets, SpaceX alone, I think, is growing at, at, at 30% a year in terms of its rocket launches. So demand seems to be fairly solid. Is the industry, industry constrained by supply? That's exactly right. It is, we cannot grow until we have more supply. And the problem is the major industrial gas companies who control the major, you know, the entire helium spectrum, the entire supply chain, not one of them is out there looking for helium. Right. Uh, because adverse. they want to control the market. Right. And well, and that's not their modus operandi, right? It's okay. the, their, their business is primarily packaged gas, nitrogen, bulk gases and, okay. and the like. So helium is a very small component of their, of their business model. Uh, but you know, they don't have the mandate to drill for helium. That's where players like, you know, Helix comes in. Right. We got to find new molecules, especially in the United States. So your contention would be, Bo, that if you find more molecules, there's plenty of demand and the market will grow as supply grows. That's exactly right. Rising tide lifts all boats. So, <clears throat> Bo, you've been in the helium business for how many years? When did you first come across? 24 years now. Okay, so the year 2000, roughly. Mm -hmm. um, how... Where, where does your principal asset in Helix, which is called Ingomar Dome, how long did it take you to put this deal together? Where does that fit in the rank of exploration helium assets in the world in the United States? So traditionally helium now, the, the, the major sources of helium are produced by the giants. ExxonMobil is the largest single domestic producer of helium in the United States by virtue of its Labarge Field in Wyoming. Right. They're taking, uh, they're taking natural gas to liquid and CO2 and helium is a, such a small component that, but they are able to extract that at the very end of that process. Right. So it's not a helium centric uh, production facility, nor is Qatar. Qatar only has 0.3% helium in their gas stream. However, the North field is so large as the liquefied, as they're liquefying the natural gas, the helium comes out the top relatively pure. Right. So easy to process. What we are after is helium as a primary target. And, and mind you, not many of those projects are capable of expansion. Qatar, yes, but, but otherwise, no. We need new additional molecules to hit the market, especially in the United States. Uh, going after helium is a primary target as opposed to secondary or tertiary. And so how big could Ingomar be? I, understand, I see from your Competent Persons report, it talks about two or three BCF as the size of the prize. And that's in the, in the context of a global annual helium market of about six BCF. Is that right? That's correct. So that could be, you could be a, a third or even a half of total annual helium consumption and production. Is that right? We could. It's, every project starts small, so you have to drill wells and increase throughput going in whatever plant you decide to build. In our case, we'll build a, a pressure swing absorption plant, which will allow us to monetize the field as it's being developed, right. with the end goal being hopefully a liquefaction unit. Right. Because if we can start producing uh, enough gas to, to warrant the installation of a liquefaction unit, our global market opens up. Gotcha. And is there a critical mass threshold that you have to get the size of the field to justify putting in the pressure swing absorption processing unit? A PSA plant, pressure swing absorption, that's generally uh, smaller fields. Okay. There's, there are a variety of those across the United States right now. For a liquefaction plant, you need about 3 BCF. That's the general rule of thumb to be able to install a liquefier. Gotcha. That's a good position to be in. Gotcha. And so that, that's the hope, that you would actually build a liquefaction plant there because it's big enough to justify the capital. That's exactly right. And have you done this before? Not a liquefaction unit, but, okay. uh, but gaseous plants, yes. Okay. And that was with a, a helium producing company, which I think is private, that you used to run. That was uh, in Canada. Yeah. It was a, a project called Mancota. Yeah. And we used uh, Lindy Engineering to build us a PSA slash membrane uh, system that was uh, very successful in monetizing our helium. And is that producing today? It is not producing today. Okay. Uh, that gas petered out, uh, watered out, out. Rel okay. rather early on. Okay. And in terms of your peers in North America, it's mainly an oligopoly of gas processing companies or big, big gas companies that 
market the helium in terms of the producers? You mentioned Exxon. Are there any other significant producers in North America? The United States uh, Bureau of Land Management okay. uh, very, was a, the other major producer in the United States. They just sold our U.S. taxpayer-owned helium yeah. to Messer. Okay. And and is Messer a French company? Messer is a German company. German company, okay. Mm -hmm. okay. And so it's, it, now it's controlled between Messer and Exxon in the United States. Okay. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It's a tight grip by two big companies. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. We need more competition. So when I think of tight grip, I can imagine sort of Exxon and Messer's hands potentially around your throat. If you discover 3 BSF of gas, like how do you remain independent if you get to critical mass? What would success look like for you personally and for Helix? Success would look like finding uh, a good end user market for our helium, to be able to market our own helium. So right now the, the helium supply chain is, it's very linear. It goes from major industrial gas company to customers. Right. And those customers over the past 20 years have been uh, allocated or have not gotten any helium at all due to a series of shortages. And many of them are sick and tired of those Allocation. So we're talking about companies like GE for MRI scanning. We're talking about Elon Musk, SpaceX, or NASA, uh, and semiconductors. I guess Intel would be the big one in the U.S. Now the big ones, I guess you could call helium uh, the end user market as a triage unit. The big customers like GE uh, will generally always get their helium. It's further down the totem pole where where customers are allocated their helium, right. the deemed lesser important users of helium. And when do you start engaging with these potential customers in, in the U.S.? As you know, we've we developed a good network of the end user market. We know who's out there. We know who needs helium. Uh, we like, uh, you know, certain certain companies over others, other over others. We do like uh, the U.S. market in particular. But uh, with regards to to hard talks, it'll be after we have uh, some sort of discovery. And if I think about the geopolitics of helium. Um, United States is the world's largest producer and consumer, I think I'm right in saying, of helium. Is that right? I think Qatar right now is for surpassing the United States as the largest producer of helium, but we are uh, neck and neck with China as far as consumption. consumption. So presumably, as the U.S. is as big as any country in consuming helium, it's a good place to discover it because your market is there to process it and sell it. Not only that, the infrastructure is in place. You know, the, the birth of the helium industry began in the United States. So there's a lot of infrastructure around there to, to move the product from one place to another. Right. There's drilling rigs available. There is, uh, you know, good, good highways, rail lines to move all of this product. And the, does it matter whether there's a Democrat or Republican government in the, in, the, in the White House, whether you get permits to go and get the helium come out of the ground? I don't believe so. Most of our project, or this particular project and other projects we're looking at are on private lands. Okay. And so the only time you run into problems are on federal lands where they can restrict access. Okay. So right now we don't, we don't see any problem with whoever is in office. Gotcha. So you go and do deals with all those private landowners and then, uh, and then you get their permission to go and drill some wells and produce some helium. That's correct. And so you mentioned other projects. Are there, have you got your own other projects? Is there more helium to discover? This is our primary focus right now, but obviously further down the pipeline, we would like to, uh, to look at others. Okay. Um, Bo, can you tell us a bit about your family background um, in terms about what success looks like for you is to get this helium to come out of the ground and to be a helium independent helium producer as part of the supply chain is what I understood. Um, presumably you're a, a shareholder in, in uh, Helix Exploration. Is it about money? Is it about showing the big boys that an independent can succeed? What's it about for you personally? That's a great question. I, I love the space. The value proposition is amazing, uh, especially because it's such a, an opaque price. Uh, it's because I've been in it for, for the past 24 years, it means I'm either crazy or I love the space. <laughs> and I love the space. Uh, early in my career, I was... Uh, I was putting together oil deals, principally out of West Texas, uh, but conventional oil, and made the quick transition in the year 2000 to helium, and I'm glad I did because conventional exploration is really no longer uh, around. It's all shale plays. Right. So what success looks like to me is, you know, finding and discovering and distributing, selling helium. Right. And, and uh, competing with the big guys who aren't out there looking for it themselves. Right. Yeah. You know? And the, you're presumably a, um, a shareholder, put your own money into the company, into this asset, Ingo Mardone? 
I did. So I, I used uh, my own funds to to acquire these uh, this this leasehold. How long did that take? It was about a two year process. Okay. Mm -hmm. And and why London? Like the only company that I know of in London, which has been here actually for a surprising long time, that's in helium, is called Helium One, and they've been looking for helium in Tanzania for at least ten years that I know about, and that's just vaguely paying attention. I believe that your chairman is the old CEO of Helium One, okay. which carries an impressive market capitalization more today than Helix of 60 million pounds. I'm not even sure if they've discovered any helium. Um, what was the reason to come to London as opposed to list Helix in the United States or maybe Canada? This was the natural fit for us. Uh, in London is the, is the preeminent exchange for uh, you know, growth resource Risk capital. companies. Yeah. Yeah. Investors here understand the risks and opportunities and in particular, they understand clearly the, the helium proposition yeah. by virtue of our oversubscribed IPO. And, I, and I, I haven't asked your chairman, David Minchin, this question. You might know the answer, not wanting to put words into your mouth, but presumably because he's moved from Tanzania Helium One to US Helix, he's telling us that he thinks that this is a good place to go and look as compared to Tanzania and potentially produce some helium. Absolutely. You know, Africa, no matter where you are, is going to be a tough place to work. Uh, from an infrastructure standpoint, it's a neat project over there. Uh, I know nothing about, I've never explored for helium in, in Africa or outside of uh, the United States and Canada, in fact. But uh, if you really want to make a, a, a mark in the United States, uh, you need to be looking for helium in areas where you can have, you can move that product quickly and you drill for it inexpensively. And can you just talk, talk us through both the economics? So. You've just raised seven and a half million pounds. Where does that get you to? Um, how much money will you have to spend to actually prove up the helium resource, two or three BCF maybe? Uh, and then how much you actually get it to come out of the ground and produce it? And then what would be the potential revenues of the company? Yeah, so so uh, potential proceeds, I mean, the, the use of proceeds rather, would be a scoping study, which would be out you know, this quarter, uh, and then appraisal well in, in quarter three of this year, and a feasibility study. I like the way you do the scoping study and the appraisal well before you've actually inverted commas discovered it. That means that it shows some confidence. Yeah, well, we, we, it's, it's just in a wonderful area where you'd expect to find helium. Right. It, it's situated in an area where known helium occurrences exist. Right. Very high ones, in fact. Me measured by well, people have drilled wells. People and wells in the past, that's correct. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And what about the Ingemar Dome? As I think you mentioned it was drilled in the 1940s by a company looking for oil or gas. That's correct. Uh, they didn't find any burnable methane, so they instead found a, um, a non-flammable gas, right? That's right. It was about 80% nitrogen, never assayed for helium. Okay. Uh, back in those days, uh, operators seldom measured for helium, uh, or if they collected a sample, it would, sat, sat, it would sit on the shelf for a while right. before it was ever analyzed. And so any you know, helium is so elusive that it'll escape any canister that it is in. Right. So, but yes, they found out of the shallower Amsden formation, um, they drill stem tested eight and a half million cubic feet of gas a day with 80% helium. Right. And so further research led me to believe- 80% helium? 80, sorry, 80% nitrogen. Okay. With no assay for helium. Okay. And uh, further research uh, showed that this should be a very helium rich environment. Indeed, I took a soil survey across the Ingemar Dome, found no anomalies other than the sample I took adjacent to that particular well bore. And not only was it an, uh, anomalously high, it was the highest reading my geochem has ever seen. So we know there's a helium system present. How much helium is down there, we don't know. Well, that's good enough for me. I mean, given your 24 year track record in the industry and the fact you spent a lot of your own money and time on accumulating the, uh, the acreage to put together the play, uh, it sounds to me like you're the guy to back. Um, what else should investors know about Helium or about you or about the project if they wanted to become shareholders in Helix? Why Helix versus Helium One or another Helium Exploration Company? Well, we're an actionable company. We're ready to move very quickly. Uh, we've got the expertise behind us. We have a, a good board. Uh, we know where to look. And I, I just think the United States, given the CHIPS Act, uh, is going to be a massive market for much more Helium usage. So, uh, you know, one thing I'll say about helium is without it, we're living in the Stone Age. It is such a high-tech gas that is crucial for high-tech industry all over the globe. 
Uh, and Boj Mami asking uh, personally, what do you do for fun? Apart from go look for helium and put together helium deals, what else do you do? Oh, well, usually general exercise, but I love uh, alpine climbing. Yeah, I know. And is, uh, so you said you live in Dallas. Is there climbing around there or in Montana maybe, right? Well, at, on the uh, other part of Montana, yes. Okay. But uh, some international climbs I've done, it's, uh, it's, it's good to have a goal. Bo, thank you for coming in to talk to us at Arlington and Mining Network today. Congratulations on a successful IPO. Actually, really difficult to do in 2024, and yours has been fabulously successful. I think we've scooped Sky News, which is where you're off to next, so I don't want to hold you up. Um, but I speak as a shareholder and uh, a helium enthusiast and looking forward to watching you drill in Fantastic. Thanks for having me. Pleasure.